we're going to uh, talk about the Italian performance right now. I'm delighted to say James Horncastle is with us. James, good morning to you. How are you? Very good, guys. How are you? Yeah, so, well, pretty excited by the quality of football we're watching from this Italian side. Uh, even their second string team are devastating and, and seem to be very much playing as a unit. It's uh, remarkable stuff we've seen from them so far. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Mancini has been saying is that, you know, I don't have 11 first-team players. I've got 26. And you, know, you mentioned the eight changes that he made for the, the starting lineup against Wales. Um, well, by the end of the game, with all the substitutions he'd, he'd made, he'd, he'd actually used 25 of the 26 guys, even his reserve goalkeeper, which I think if you were Welsh and you saw Salvatore Sirigu coming on for Juju Donnarumma in the final five or ten minutes, you were wondering what you were participating in. And, Look, I mean, they were already qualified, but um, if they if the result didn't go their way they, yesterday, Wales had the chance to win the group. They they got the job done. I think what was really encouraging, and you know, when speaking to people on Mancini's staff before the before the tournament, they were worried that Marco Verratti uh, uh, was going to be a big miss for the first few games of the season. Yeah, uh, but the, the tournament, it turned out that Manuel Locatelli uh, more than uh, deputised for him in those first two games, but when but as he came back uh, for, for the Wales game, you know, it was like he'd never been away. And uh, I think, again, that just builds confidence for, for the team. And, and, you know, while the knock on them so far is OK in this 31-game on beaten run, who have they played? You know, the Netherlands, Portugal, Poland, all of whom I think are really good teams. <laughs> um, you know, they're really confident that with this style of football, with this team spirit, they can go all the way. It does seem, obviously, this was like some sort of, um, I, I guess, uh, goodbye between Italian fans and the Italian team as they go on their travels now and, and, and try and win this thing out. And there was this unbelievable reception, by all accounts, when, when, when Mancini's name gets read out and when, when Mancini comes up on screen and when anything Roberto Mancini uh, appears in this Italian scenario. J just how loved by Italian fans is this man right now? Well, you've got to remember the circumstances in which he got the job, um, which was 2018, one of the lowest moments in, in Italian football history. First time they'd missed out on qualifying for the World Cup in, 26, uh, in 60 years. Um, yeah, they uh, were humiliated, really. Uh, and he, he came in. I think he needed them as much as uh, they needed him as well, because, you know, really after uh, doing such a great job at City, um, you know, he's drifted, really, from Galatasaray to St. Petersburg. And, you know, he's, he's, instead of downplaying the national team, which some of his predecessors have done, he's really talked them up. He said, look, we've won the World Cup four times. We've been to the European Championship final. You know, we're a great football nation. Let's get back to doing that. And I think the style of football with which, you know, I mean, he's really built his team around Jorginho, Verratti, and Barella, and Insigne, players that were available to uh, his predecessors, quality players with skill, but who yeah, didn't really fit into other people's systems. And he's built the team around them. He said, look, I'm not going to impose my system on you. I want to, I want to get as much quality in this team as possible. And they played a style of football which has made you know, Italians stand up and, and be entertained. And uh, I think that, combined with you know, what we've all been through in the last 18 months, but you know, I mean, Italy was really, I think, the first European epicenter of the, the pandemic. I think there's this desire to just see, uh, well, watching and communing something together. Uh, and Mancini's bringing along the entire nation. He's really talking to the, the team up as being in a sort of an agency of positivity. Um, and it, it's, it's working. It's working. I mean, it's, it's, it, even if you're not Italian, it's hard not to watch this thing uh, and have a smile kind of grow across your face. So that's kind of it then, really. Like the, the 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 sense that maybe that Italy were being held back, that the happiness was being bottled up over the last few years, even even pre-pandemic. Was there that sense, James? Well, I think the other thing is is Italy usually go into major tournaments um, uh, with in a really tense atmosphere, um, either because that's just how they train. You know, they cloister themselves away and, and they have like a monastic kind of preparation. I mean, that was the criticism. Of, Fabio Capello, when he was in charge of England in South Africa, you remember that the, the training camp that they had in, in Rustenburg in the middle of nowhere. And instead, you know, Mancini has, has wanted everyone to have fun, you know, train with music on, uh, play lots of games. I mean, there's this crazy kind of variety show that they had on, on Rai, the state broadcaster, to announce the squad, which, you know, had, you know, Mancini and, and Daniel De Rossi, his assistant, playing uh, 
sort of paddle, which is, you know, sort of table tennis with a pair of frying pans. I mean, just, just all kinds of crazy things to keep morale going. And, uh, and you can see that the, the, the positivity within the group, the fact that this, I think the other interesting thing is that you've got two Juventus players who are starting, Chiellini and Bonucci, but one into player in, in, in Nicola Borella in midfield. And you've got Donna Roma, who's now going to Paris Saint-Germain. The rest of the squad is, is guys who, you know, really kind of play together, coming up from the under-15s at Italy level, you know, who, who maybe play together at, at, on loan at smaller clubs like Pescada in Insigne, Verratti, and uh, uh, Immobile's case. The other guys who, who play together for Sassuolo, Ferradi, and uh, Locatelli. They all know each other inside out. They're mates. They're not rivals. And I, I think that, uh, that really makes the difference, uh, uh, along with the kind of style that they've been trusted to play. Can I ask a little bit more about Mancini? The, the, I, I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but as far as I know, he was like a teenage sensation, so has, has largely been in the public eye and had a, a sense of responsibility from the time that he was 17 or 18. And is, is, this, uh, is this current relationship that he has with the Italian public one of those relationships that comes about by virtue of the fact that you reach a certain point in in maturity where everybody realizes that actually this guy's really special and we should have loved him a bit more over the years we should have given him the same kind of currency as we would have given the great team of viali and baggio even though mancini was around at that time was part of that trinity but never actually had the same glory as them i think that's a really interesting point um because you know i mean he was uh, he was a prodigy uh, you know when he he came on the scene in the 80s made his debut when he was 17 that was unheard of really um at the time remember it, you know italian football is, is quite famous for, for only trusting young players very late you're young until you're about 27 uh in italy um and you know, he was as um as baggio i mean you look at where mancini won he won at sampdoria who'd never won anything before he won at Lazio, who hadn't won anything since the 70s even as a coach he won things at inter who hadn't won anything for 18 years at city for more than 40 years you know, he is he is a winner, but I think you know when you talk about you know, appreciation for him, not so much as a, as a player, but as, as, as someone a Hall of Famer, let's say in the, in the history of Italian football, because he had this kind of irascible uh, uh, kind of attitude where he would really flare up quite easily if you didn't if you didn't play him, if you left him out, if, if, if he wasn't on the team, which was certainly the case with the national team. We did it. A long read on the athletic about his kind of troubled relationship as a player where you know i mean he only played um at euro 88 he was a squad uh, he was a squad player at italian 90 never got a minute and this is his second chance really um to get the kind of glory that he had with his club side with the national side which eluded him um as a player and you know i, I think that experience the fact that he never got off the bench at italian 90 he never got to play in front of uh, the nazi magic at the olympico I think that's one of the reasons why you saw him make all those substitutions, all those changes uh, against Wales. He wanted the, the guys in that squad to get the experience that he didn't have. And I, I think that second chance um, he's got and, and the willingness he's given to give opportunities to, to the players he's called up just really kind of, again, plays into the, the enthusiasm, the excitement and just the good vibe around the national team. Would Mancini, the player, have had a better chance of succeeding in the Mancini, the manager's team, than the team of Italia 90, for example? Uh, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he would definitely be the most talented player on the pitch. I mean, that, again, that just goes to show uh, how talented that generation he was a part of uh, was uh, in the 80s and 90s. And you know, it, it's one of the things that has played into why his predecessor, the town, played. Um, the national team, I mean, he's got a bit of a, a, a new generation coming through. But I mean, he doesn't have the kind of number 10 that you used to expect of, uh, of Italy or the great striker um, that you, you, you had of Italy. Um, but, you know, I think he would have enjoyed it. I mean, it's curious. I mean, you know, in the, in the, uh, from 92 to, to 96, I mean, he, he, he did have the chance to play under Riva Saki, whose Milan side was, were, were famous as one of the the teams that changed the course of his football history with their pressing and that sort of thing. But Shaki was very, very rigid um, and would often go with players who fit his system rather than the most talented players on the team. I mean, you remember uh, from, from uh, watching them as Ireland fans in, uh, in, at the World Cup in 94, 
his relationship with Roberto Baccio was not it was not good. Um, so I don't know. I, I think the, the, the comparison, I suppose, with the City team is this. Maybe the one that Mancini broke into as a as a young player, the one that went to Euro eighty eight, the one that went to Italia ninety, which was a, a group of under twenty one players who had success on the one of the company men at the Italian Football Federation is Elio Vicini and they, they just had a freshness about them. Um, I think you really see that freshness again uh, in the Italian side. You just seem to be unburdened. You don't seem to have you don't seem to be feeling pressure, you just seem to be excited to be at a major tournament. Certainly after missing the World Cup and after what Eighteen months of not playing in front of in front of fans. Yeah, great to have you with us, James. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Pleasure, guys. James Horncastle there. You can read his stuff in the Athletic, and of course you can watch him on BT Sport as well. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We'd love to hear from you. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty. That's the WhatsApp number. Or of course, you can leave a comment on the YouTube channel if uh, you want to. What's your take on where Italy are at the moment, Owen? Yeah, like we're moving right to the top of the pile uh, alongside Belgium at the moment. Uh, I do think that you, you can take your pick with, um, with with France, Portugal, and Germany maybe as well uh, in a in a tier just below that. But uh, I guess when you when you look at early season form or early tournament form, you can only really blame the opposition so much, considering some of the upsets that we've come close to seeing already. And uh, Italy and Belgium have kind of shown a new gear when ever questions have been asked of them so far. So your power rankings would be five, Germany, Let, four. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. See, I'm on, I'm on a spot here now. So let's go five Germany. Let's go with. Uh, let's go with four. Portugal. Let's go with three, Italy. Let's go with two France and let's go at one Belgium and right. I hope I haven't said the same team twice there. You haven't, you haven't, but you did put um, Germany behind Portugal even though Germany just beat Portugal 4-2. That's a good point, I did just do that didn't I? Yeah, uh, that, that was, that's you pretty, can that's pick pretty, them around that's if you pretty want. embarrassing. I'll let, I'll let you make that change, uh, I'll, I'll, you can change that one. So it's uh, Portugal 5, Germany 4. Yeah, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Let's go with a bit of recency bias. Nothing like it because Portugal have never come back from a disappointing uh, group stage result before to, to win the whole thing.